We're about to start the next panel. My name is Zoya Litvin. I have experience in education area for more than 15 years, and I am honored to moderate this panel, Education 5.0, Our Brain in the New Reality. So today we'll talk about the brain, the education, the new wonderful world in the perspective, from the perspective of neurosciences in wonderful company. So I'll present. Viktor Komarenko, member of the Ukrainian, Neuro, uh, Ukrainian Society of Neuroscience and the Federation of European Societies of Neuroscience. He can explain complicated things in a simple way. Your piece of applause. Okay. Yuri Gogotsy, Ukrainian scientist, director of the A.J. Drexel Nanomaterials Institute, and is any scientist. Well, for me, this is an owner of the super brain. I do think he is. He'll tell us what we do to get the mega strong brain. Yeah. So, Valeria Zabolotna. I know Valeria is the top manager of uh, various educational projects. She's the founder. And uh, now she educates the top managers, the adults. She's the director of the DTAC Academy. And uh, we have Serehid Danilov. The IT guy, the neuroscientist, founder and CEO of the Behavior Academy and R&D Labs. He is designing educational solutions, the IT solutions primarily. So the aim of this panel is to understand how our brains works in the post uh, 4.0 industrial revolution, how it adapts, how it educates. So. From Daniel Kahneman, a quote from Daniel Kahneman, fast and slow thinking. He said that human nature is not changing. Only uh, what only changes where we invest our time. In social media, we mostly do in doom scrolling, in some other things. And uh, many scientists, many philosophers agree that we we'll live in the golden fish era when our ability to concentrate is shrinking and um, that's not something that evolution was keeping for us <laughs> or maybe it's not that scary as it seems or do we need to adapt or the brain is doing that already so who will start the panel so uh some interactive piece for you please a question to the screen you all have the chat bots in your telegram when you registered you did you have, I had a chance to download it so if you do have it give me an answer to that question okay organizers do bring it stereotypes uh, and brain awareness okay I'll give you the question so many of us uh, argue how effectively do we use the brain what you think of it the audience what percentage the average person what percentage of the brain capacity what do we use like 90 percent 10 percent 50 okay tech support tech support I can see that there is a delay, uh, some technical issue. Let's try to come back to that question later. And uh, I'll just come to Victor directly. And um, to talk about brain, we actually have to understand what, what affects the brain, not only in this, uh, within this fourth industrial revolution, what people are interested in. Uh, what is the connection between brain and body? Since school, we know that brain actually uh, rules the body, controls the body, but the vice versa approach, uh, process, the opposite process. Our cognitive abilities, uh, do they depend on the brain? Three components, genetics. Um, so what we get from ancestors, the way of living, the lifestyle, and the age. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Of course, our body is an integral complex and brain affects the body parts and the body itself affects the brain its functioning and its cognitive abilities and here we get the question so do the genetical factor is this a dominating one when it comes to 
formation of uh, cognitive abilities, we manifest. We have some serious research with a huge number of subjects involved, which show that the academic performance, when you speak about academic performance, genetic factor is the dominating and 70% of success. Uh, and this specific area is determined by your genes. Why? Because maybe, for example, the amount of neurons and synapses uh, do depend uh, on genetic information uh, kept in us, in our DNA, and uh, the cognitive reserve amount is shaped by genetic uh, structures. Some um, cell structures, its quality and quantity depends on genetics as well. So the genetic component is considered to be a dominator. <laughs> More dom it dominates more than actually the upbringing, the external environment, and so on, comparing to that. So the second issue, what is really important to understand? So it appears to be that there are a couple of ways. Today we separate a couple of areas, allowing us to improve the cognitive abilities of the brain and the behavioral one. So. Uh, it doesn't give any damage. It's quite a useful way. When you change your behavior in life, that's how you can affect your cognitive abilities. What can be an example of that behavior which may uh, um, increase the resource, uh, the capacity and the resource? So physical uh, load and sport, quite primitive, but not the primitive as it seems, sleep. Yes, this is quite a good thing, sleeping. <laughs> it's really pleasant. Don't ignore that, by the way. Don't ignore that. Yeah, yeah. We speak about training and learning and education. So those who actually graduated from school and continue systemically to study every year of the systemic learning So actually saves you from dementia and other degenerative processes. It gives you extra four years. You have one year of systemic learning and you have plus four years of healthy life, of common sense in your life. So <laughs> yeah, so of healthy brain. And we uh, did talk about computer games. Okay, it appears to be that computer games, this is not that harmful thing, that this is not shitty at all. And this is not dangerous. A lot of research there is that really proves that shooters, uh, wonder, wondrous advent, adventures and all that stuff. These online computer games actually helps you to increase our social skills, improve our social skills and cognitive skills as well. So with games, you have to be just, uh, don't be that radical, okay? Don't be that negatively radical, but please use it properly because this is definitely a tool we can use to improve our socialization uh, and uh, Cognitive abilities as well. Okay. And uh, you asked me about age. With age, you actually lose this. Uh, the, the plasticity, flexibility of the brain minimizes. Okay. So by some time, people thought, by some moment, uh, actually, uh, at some moment, people thought that the amount of neurons is only shrinking because a certain fixed amount we get when we are born. But some structures of our brain are formed uh, like continuously, are generated continuously. Don't forget about this interesting ability you have to use neuroplasticity. With the help of it, we actually can um, increase uh, the amount of neural contacts and to enhance the neurogenesis, generating new cells in the brain. So this enhancement of the brain plasticity directly or can directly be determined by the way we live. So if we are physically active, trust me, oh, trust me, uh, with this process, there'll be, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be just fine. For the lazy people, yes, physical education, don't be that intense with it. Just three times... Uh, per week, moderate physical load, like uh, walking with fast pace and uh, 
running itself allows you to activate neurogenesis and new neural relations will form and this is really great for cognitive functions and for happy life for happy conscience life within a long period so we have the results by the way we know what people do think people are convinced that we use our brain only only 10 percent of it we use I save the resources of my brain. I try to, but I, um, but it doesn't work. I use it 100%. This is one of the myths, because neurobiologists say that our brain we use it uh, with almost 90%, 90 plus at 90 plus. Okay. Okay, Yuri. Uh, I just want to ask you, as a person, as a scientist. But a philosophical question. So many scientists like the Kahneman we started with, they know that today people are not that smart as our ancestors were 300, 500 years ago. They say that from the scientific point of view, so the brain is shrinking, <laughs> literally, and uh, from another point of view, they say that the amount of free time that people do have today because people don't care today so much about where to hunt, how to survive, where to get food. So the progress took it all, and we have a lot of free time, and we don't invest this time at self-development and uh, in some uh, high-level cognitive tasks, and we invest it into shit, into scrawling, basically. <laughs> so do you agree with that? I don't agree with this, but I am not a specialist, an expert in this area. I can just tell you what I think. Maybe I'll pick English because, uh, for example, I really loved it. The previous panel, we had three languages used, Russian, Ukrainian, and English. And I think for cognitive, uh, for our cognitive abilities, this is really good. This is a practice for the brain. For the audience, I can say that you have a chance to get your headphones and get the translation. Um, I don't think, uh, I don't know whether our brains are smaller now. Maybe mine is smaller, but before people were busy with how to survive, but certainly they were spending a lot of uh, the rest of the time when they were not caring about food or survival, eating, having sex, and as soon as they invented alcohol, drinking. And I don't think they really required a lot of brain power uh, to do this here. What happens, I think, without going back 500 years ago, I can compare myself and my children who are around 30, and this is the age of many people in the audience. They just think differently. They have many more activities multitasking. They actually learn and think more than I learned. They just learn it differently. And the way they think is different. And let me tell you, I realized it 20 years ago. We just moved to a new house. And I tell my children, look, we need something for dinner. Go get a telephone book and find a place where you can order food. And both my kids, which were 9 and 10, synchronously went in the opposite direction to their computers to search for a place. In a computer, now they would just uh, pull uh, their smartphones. And this was the moment I realized we think differently, we behave differently. So what it means practically here, we need to appreciate differences in learning environment. I learn all the time because I'm a scientist. I do new things every day. It's not a systematic learning, so I'm not sure uh, following Victor's uh, uh, thesis that it helps my brain to develop, but I never stop learning. People who work in science, people who are in business management, pretty much learn all their life. So I feel we just need to appreciate, understand, and people who are actually try to work on understanding how our brains work, how to stimulate them, may help us to do it in a more efficient way. But I think this is really is important here because we need to adjust changes in the way we teach and do things to our current life to all this uh, media 
again, following up on the previous panel and take benefit of it, uh, not consider it to be a problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Said he, Yuri said, well, he touched upon the children's issue. Children are different today. So in this new reality, how to train children, how to teach children. We had this clip thinking we all know what that is and we heard of it. How to change accordingly, how to keep the pace, keep the pace. So I'm not sure that we have the clip thinking. It may be another like modern trend like many of these uh, cliche trends, seven, eight seconds for the fish. No, 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 it sounds great in articles, pseudoscientific articles, but uh, nobody knows what to do with children. We definitely adapt, but when we face some serious changes, uh, many people suffer from it. And I really don't want to have those children who are captured in, who are in the eye of the hurricane, yes? and. Uh, it's, it will really be a tragedy if you don't find uh, some support for them to adapt to the changes. No, it's, it will be horrible. I agree with what Yudi said. It's of crucial importance not just to learn, not just to teach, but when we have the efforts for learning. Yes, we have the continuous learning. We can't live another way. And I'm not sure that this type of learning will, will help me to live longer, better, and to give me some new opportunities. If someone was listening to the previous discussion, we continue it. Uh, today's way of consuming information pushes us not to concentrate on it. We all the time, we get something that only ignites the curiosity and we can switch from one to another. And this is cool because definitely uh, in this specific way, we capture a lot. We cover a lot. We take a lot of information on the world, which is becoming more and more complicated. But we have very serious problems, which again, you mentioned at the previous panel, we can see this mad growth of um, mental disorders. You know, huge amount of those who suffer from a depression, anxiety, and the models that person should be ready to adapt to. School. Uh, and a goal for this school learning, so these are destroyed on a way. When you talk to students, they say, we come to work and nobody asks for the diploma. Nobody's interested in that piece of plastic. Why I spent five years in that, you know, that place? So we have two global problems. First, we destroyed the world that we've been creating for centuries, like for two centuries at least. The traditional school is a system which was being formed like for two uh, centuries. Now it stopped working. It will never work like it did before. It will not function like it. The second problem is that the type of communication between people, the type of information consumption that we face, it's, it destroys the normal uh, children's development. In the street, you see a mother with a pram, you know, and uh, She's looking at her phone and the child is okay if the child is just looking somewhere. But the worst thing is when a child is, I don't know, if, if the person, uh, if the child is actually facing some threat. Steel face experiment, just you can see it on YouTube. It's shown what's happening with a child if mother staying next to the child even has this uh, uh, poker face for a couple of seconds, 30, 40 seconds. And for them, it's, it's great stress that there is no social interaction with the mother. And the very essence of this interaction is that she guides the, him to things around, the feelings, what do they feel, what's the status right now. So that kind of social uh, cohesiveness is now being eroded by devices. And you know what's most importantly, that we don't know what that leads to. If we see the first generation, more or less, that lives uh, in this kind of world. So there's a huge problem in that regard. Well, that gives a lot of hope. The old things don't work, but the new things are not discovered yet. No, why not? It's just that we have to be based in science, and science, uh, works in slow pace and just technologies are running ahead of it they are they are much faster than we can react to 
So, at least when we talk about kids, uh, small kids, you have to be, you have to regulate them more. You have to, the parents should regulate, and that needs that means parents should be educated, right? Okay, and we await the evidence base. Okay, we talked about children. You are expert in andragogy in education for adults. How's that new reality impacting the education for adults? The PWC published a study recently. Over the period of pandemic, the adults started um, valuing in education much more. They are ready to invest much more because in this turbulent time, education, high quality education is one of the small guarantees for you. What trends do you see in uh, andragogy or education for adults? I don't think uh, people like more to, to learn more, but it's not that I'm seeing. And adults have, they're busy, they're pretty busy, and just 1% of them have the time to really study over the course of the day. So if you look at the business environment, it's very, it's changed a lot. If you look at the ed educational industry, it's the most rigid industry, it's changing so slowly because we're scared. We don't know how to do the right way. If you look at um, in terms of how educated Ukrainians are, you know, in innovative economic systems, um, higher education, but about 60% of population. What do you think? What's the percentage of high educated, highly educated people in Ukraine? 80, 82, right. We are the nation of unemployed bachelors and masters. What it means in terms of uh, in terms of employers, we have a qualification a gap. We fight for the talents. We are looking for people who are not being trained in the market. My new direction basically unites different industries they're different and i'm looking for people who would know everything and it's hard to find one person a lot of employers understand that in the next three to five years from 50 to 100 percent of our employees will have to be retrained to do something else as for the retraining we are in the process of democratization of information when we're tired from information. Having little time and that we are tired from information, how to make adults retrain or re-educate more effectively. So as for the trends, of course, um, that's stackable learning. When there's so little time for training for adults, we understand that you can provide skills and knowledge by micro-learning. But micro-learning, you can't uh, learn everything because there are complex things. So this stackable learning, when you build new skills on uh, previous skills and throughout life you start building your knowledge, that's the trend that currently is there. Next, interactive, but interactive, real interactive. When we say that the person who trains is the main character in the training, you have to do something. The information that they need right now, right here, that solves specific task. So we are training, we're building the training course that is a mixture of programming, methodology, pedagogic, andragogic, etc. And we talk about personalization of training. Because we all have our experiences. Uh, like a baggage of training. Each of us is training differently. Therefore, we have to move towards personalization, where based on what you know, based on how you are, how you learn, what kind of learner you are, 
The information comes to you at the time when you need it, when you need it. Okay, Yuri, then let's continue this question to you because you are uh, a little bit a product of our uh, local education, but you've been working in the West for a long time with leading institutions. If the educational system has to be rethought or redesigned, what your advice is there for, for Ukrainian educational system? You can focus on higher education for people, for adults, and how Western higher education system manages this these challenges that we faced. Well, I think that in Ukraine right now, the educational system is not very well tackling the challenges. I see it in our students and the interns in uh, Ukrainian universities. But I think that Ukraine needs not to catch up, but to change the system of education, not only in Ukraine. It's always an opportunity. We talk about use of these devices. Yes. Two-year kids get a smartphone and start learning. But what does it mean? Professor at, say, Kiev National University comes and starts teaching chemistry or economics. And this kid who has been uh, browsing internet for years goes online and finds a lecture of the best professor in the world and tells, why should I listen to this guy when I can learn from the best? And trust me, those people give exciting lectures. You cannot stop listening, even if it's not your topic. This is how adults learn. So what is necessary to do is now start changing the systems and say, a teacher in the school or professor at the university is not like they're giving a lecture based on a textbook, but Students listen to the best person in the world speaking. And a teacher helps to interpret, answer questions, do practical exercises. And my feeling this is a system change is going to happen in the world. It's inevitable. Smart people, Massachusetts of Technology, they started to put about 10 years ago all lectures online because they want to capture the war, basically the business of education worldwide. And people will not go and take an average, say, Drexel professor lecture or uh, Kiev Polytechnic uh, professor lecture. They will listen to someone who is the best. I may teach better than everyone else a couple of topics. But as a university professor, I'm required to teach many other different topics. And I know there are better people elsewhere who can do it better than me. And my feeling, this is a change that everyone needs to make. So whoever makes it first a system, maybe a national system, practice at top schools, university, whether it's a high school or actually maybe even middle school uh, or adult education or university education. I think this is where the future of education is going anyway. So be the first one, lead the world, and then this 80% of uh, uh, jobless uh, uh, people with a BS degree will become uh, leaders in the world in uh, high tech and future technologies. Yeah. Ambitious. <laughs> well, uh, maybe not everyone will agree, but uh, I think at least this is a vision I have at the moment. Right, we have uh, a chat bot. You can throw questions there to the speakers. We will have the time for Q&A. So drop your questions there. Victor, a question to you. Not so much about the system, but about some life hacks. How is it possible, is it possible at all to hack the work of a brain? We've heard the epidemics of consuming retilin and other chemicals that help people focus deeper, learn better, more effective. How would What's your attitude to this methodology and what your safe recipes are in order to bring our brain to the maximum of cognitive power? Well, that's a question which is very relevant, but not an easy question. The theory says that, yes, we can influence the ability of our brain 
to think. And so modern technologies of understanding complex processes allows with a correct approach to really improve some cognitive functions. But it's very important here to account for a huge uh, number of factors, like nootropic uh, drugs. They're not harmful things, but they increase your cognitive functions and your mental indicators. But turns out that uh, they also have a catch. First of all, each of us have different tolerance to these uh, substances because from birth we have different uh, number of receptors. That's one thing. Secondly, uh, nootropics uh, can accumulate. It's a cumulative action that can lead to protracted state of super excitement that's not okay for your body, for your cognitive functions. Uh, we say that lengthy studies do not show that there is a only positive effect that there's positive effect of nootropics on uh, your cognitive processes in the long run or short run. Nootropics are more effective for people who have uh, some dementia or deterioration of cognitive functions. They have very little influence on healthy. So the question is, is that a quick way out to increase our mental capacity? Is it not the way towards nothing? I would not recommend to use chemicals to increase your functions. Well, yeah, there are some functions. I'm very categorical in what I'm saying right now, maybe wrong in being so categorical. But here's a small example. If you like coffee, you know that, that coffee is a drug, it's a narcotic stimulant. They can really increase your brain activity to provide you a better focus to memorize information better, like nicotine. It's a drug. On the other hand, it's also an effective activator of the brain. And if you use it properly, you can apply it as a increase to increase um, in cognitive functions. But there's also always a negative effect for, for negative, and you have to be able to control it. It's a very important thing so that you're not addicted. Plus, there are some technological things that basically uh, describe how electrical stimuli act in our brain, but that's different technologies through physics, but there are also some uh, negative things that to consider. So for each of us, the, the easiest but the most complex way with many positive effects for the whole body will be things like simple physical training and sports. I'm saying every time about that because by strengthening your physical capacity, you activate processes with brain and immune system, adaptive system, and all of them include these brain reactions that strengthen neurogenetic functions, uh, building new neural chains, new storage space for the information. So get give yourself some training. Give yourself some time to build uh, new neural connections, and then the new knowledge will um, be uh, taking the place the, that you release, the free space that you release from unnecessary stuff. But a healthy way of living and enough physical activity is one of the main components that provides um, the natural ha hack positive hack to our brain. So it seems simple, but people want easier recipes. Well, even more easier? Yeah, okay, I understand. So talking about the brain hacks, question to you about technical uh, things. So Elon Musk just invested in Neuralink startup, uh, which wants to produce microchips for brain. And Yuri may add something to that, since he designed neuroelectrodes. Interesting how they work and where we're moving with the studies. 
So what's your attitude to this opportunity to hack your brain? How realistic it is in the nearest future? Well, it's already here and now available, but whether you will allow to uh, install some holes in your brain to insert some augmentation. Well, we did work with uh, rats and other animals. It's not, it doesn't look too nice, you know. There's always a per small percentage of difficult side effects. So in reality, it is a question, it's a very pertinent question because how we as a society will allow to use these technologies on us. So the way that this, the uh, Elon Musk follows now, I, it's, it's not about augmenting everyone's mental ability. It's, it's a way to rehabilitate after serious damage, brain damage. So new, modern neural interfaces allow um, for mental work to translate thought information through synth speech synthesizers. And that reaches up to 90 words per minute. My speech now is about like 150. Imagine a paralyzed person will be, will be able to speak uh, almost at the normal pace. So it's incredibly great. Uh, as well as treatment of different um, um, brain illnesses like um, stroke and so on. So it's a very promising technology. Elon Musk didn't do anything super revolutionary. He just pushed the technology some 10 years ahead. But if you look a little deeper, but if we talk about stimulating the brain through outside stimuli, it's not the way for biology. Because we are liquid computers, you know, and biology works through chemical regulation of processes. If you look at from technologies that are already being used to regulate um, behavior, uh, to study the behavior of rats. We have a technology that uh, we talked about chemical stimulation. When I take a substance, um, they have uh, no tropics or very low efficacy, but what works? Amphetamines. Amphetamines are drugs. No tropics, by the way. Oh, let's talk about amphetamines. There's a great work which shows that students before an exam, through ethical um, approval, they g give them a vitamin dose on students to see how it impacts their exam. And yes, it did increase their mental capacity, but those who are giving some placebo, it, they are getting the same reinvigoration. So we want to believe and it's a placebo effect. We want to believe, and through psychosomatic reaction, we believe that it will help us. Like there's a uh, story by Jack London uh, about a piece of meat. That's the same effect. But the brain is a very complex thing. Just recently, there was an article about cognitive functions of the brain spread out into hemispheres. So. The scientists looked at the data in the literature, 600 different cognitive functions that we have in our brain. There are many more of them. We don't know exactly how many functions are there. And imagine that each of these functions, uh, the brain, for each of them, the brain organizes some kind of independent module, like a spatial module, or it's, it's some anatomical departments. There has to be a department organized in my brain for me to be able to talk or recognize faces, etc. So there are technologies that allow me through genetic vectors, basically through genetic modif modification, to insert uh, synthetic receptors to the brain that only get into some specific zone of the brain. Then take some tablet that only acts on these synthetic receptors. 
and to stimulate only a specific zone of the brain. Like for instance, I want to become, I want to win the competition, let's say. That depends uh, some 80% from my psychological cap capacity. Imagine 20 sportsmen on the Olympic Games who will fight for the first prize. Technically, they are equal. There will always be difference in psychology, which zone is stimulated. Like, you can stimulate the proper zone, and I win more, because I have the motivation to fight much more than the people that I fight against. So that's what we can do. Fortunately, it's only done with rats at the moment and other animals. So the question is, like, we will live in this world, and our generation, maybe our friend, our children, will have to decide. Will we allow to use this technology for peop with people? And it's a big ethical question. Right, so the brain in the new reality needs new dope, no, new dope. Hopefully not. Okay, do you want to add something? I am uh, for chemical uh, augmentation, like coffee. I start drinking coffee at about 6 a.m. And I may drink about 10 cups per day. It increases the concentration of attention, but it decreases creativity a little bit. For you, maybe it's not so important. But let me add, uh, well, I add uh, tennis on top of that, some sports. Uh, basically, what we do, we develop materials, electrodes, for both implanting into brain and also for external measuring brain function, like encephalography. And uh, I fully agree with Sergei that it's a good thing to do to help people after stroke, people with various type of problems, rehabilitation. We don't know how it will act in the long term, but there are experiments showing that it's possible to create dependence similar to chemical dependence by affecting uh, some part of the brain here. So I would say that uh, I would be extremely cautious we still have a lot to learn about how the brain functions. And what I, I, I look at all this development as really tools to better understand brain functions rather than accelerate it here. Even though I'm sure there will be people in uh, military, there will be people in uh, corporations that will uh, look at ways of uh, improve, make either a super soldier, uh, who is brave and doesn't need to drink uh, 100 gram, uh, 100 gram для храбрости не нужно, uh, and will uh, go and sacrifice his or her life uh, without thinking, or something else. But again, my feeling it's a very important technology. We use use it to understand the brain, to help uh, people with some deficiencies or for rehabilitation. Uh, but I certainly don't want to have a chip implanted into my brain. Thank you for the questions. We receive your questions. And Valery, I address the next question to you together with the question from the audience. So here's the question. You mentioned talents, that we have to find talents. We have to invest a lot of time to build those talents. So the question was, what do you think? What kind of talents have the um, have to be will to be the most demand? Uh, are they going to be super specialists in one narrow topic or multifunctional specialists who are in the fusion of different uh, industries? And also a question about andragogy, education of adults. The Federation of Employers in the U.S. did a survey. Eighty percent of our employability is determined by soft skills, teamwork, creativity, being able to communicate, present yourselves. So to what extent these soft skills, is it realistic to develop if you're an adult, if you're already formed as a personality? From your experience, well, I stopped using, uh, stopped using the term soft skills. Why? Because when this term was coined, first of all, it's so vague, soft. We know that there are hard skills, that's something solid about your job, that to be 
employable and there are soft skills that are nice to have but not necessarily and even when employers say soft skills you can read it in their faces that they're not too serious so i suggest no, no longer to use the soft with these skills so that it's not misleading to what we're talking about we're talking about interpersonal skills and or humane skills and it's about systemic thinking critical thinking creativity being able to communicate and it's about effective cooperation and communication and that's what these ephemeral soft skills fit into that we talked about so for me for instance it would seem like uh, you can't say to a company manager that communication is their soft skills it's their hard skills it's how they work it's how they spend 80 percent of their work it's communication working with information etc so when we talk about these skills they are not deficient deficient they're not staying with you from childhood they are accumulative it's something that we can improve all the time as a lifelong learning and that's something we need a lot I can't say that they are not taught at school at all, but there's an English school tradition where they teach thinking and formulating their words, their thoughts. And other countries do stress this as well. First learn to think and then learn a profession. We know that in a profession we will be able to choose to change the world. We are always a little nervous about where to give our children to learn, what profession there will be, what will di disappear. It's so vague, it's scary. Because earlier, it was sufficient to have one job throughout the life, be, one, be the professionals in one thing, and then you, there's a guarantee of employment. It's not enough for now. But what's, what's gonna be needed is that interpersonal skills when you are able to work with information, when you are able to create new things, when you can effectively interact with other people, then you'll be able to learn everything else. You can reorient or reorient yourself. Coming back to the question from the audience about specialization, I think that yes, you need specialization in some types of activity on some stage of this industry. And that's what you have to pursue. But we're going to change professions. Professions will become different. And to find a necessary professional five years ago and now, those are different people, honestly. And I have requests different to people who come to uh, get employment. So much more attention should be paid to cognitive abilities that allow us to adapt to orient or in the space around and then uh, it's uh, going to be great so the talents so yes it's scary even now we have this gap and we can't always find people we need whereas more and more people will be on the crossroads their skills are not needed anymore and it's a challenge that society and humanity has never encountered before we are on the brink of a massive retraining of adults and how to do that we don't know and we don't have any institutions how to, what, which would do that right can i have a, ask a question valeria how about the internet i think that this institution where you can learn and what I've seen I don't know about uh, Ukraine but in many countries uh, in the West also China is a great example when the pandemic struck people started training learning not only learning but finding interesting lectures in my uh, area nanotechnology the Chinese uh, scientists from Beijing University they 
called it I can X. I can something new, something unknown. First, it was for the small circle of scientists. I was one of the first ones, and it was 7,000 in two months when they started working with different platforms uh, in China on YouTube. Half a million people were listening to the scientific lecture, and it was hard to believe. It was unimaginable before the pandemic that half a million people would get together. So it was five weeks ago and five platforms, people around this platform were listening. And I think it's what's available now. We have to learn how to use it as a system. First thing, in your speech, you said that it was created for the scientists. Indeed, intellectual people, they were looking for these opportunities and finding them. Secondly, is the numbers that you operate. Even a hundred thousand compared to eight billion of people uh, in the world. I'm just saying that, yeah, we can reteach 100,000. Smart people will be able to relearn. But we talk about a massive scale, this huge gap. And the situation we're on the brink of, we're shutting down coal mines. What will the coal, coal miners do? They won't be gladly learning uh, high-tech skills. So we're talking about a humongous amount of people that will fall into the chasm of absence of qualification. So we said at the very beginning, scroll, they will, will, they will be scrolling social networks, playing virtual worlds. And also another important thing, in a storm of information, we are so gullible to buy in to disinformation or misinformation. We are not always able to tell something's just exciting from something really scientific. So my concern is that whether we we are sh understaffed, but we don't know where to get the stuff. So questions about from the audience about the retraining. People say that it's fast. It's faster to learn when you're young. How can you really learn something if you're 45 plus? Because it's so slow. Is it true that you learn slowly when you get older? So, <clears throat> we have various intensity of metabolism. Yes, it's different in the body, and of course there are some changes. But, 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 I like to say the following. So, learning is a natural need for the brain. So, what does it mean? Uh, I don't understand that... I don't understand this in the following way. So we, our brain always learns, always. So don't push anyone to learn. Don't just encourage them that, don't force them. Just create favorable, convenient conditions for learning. Okay, so I am as a, a university professor or a trainer working with adults and corporations. I do have to organize the learning process in such a way for the brain of my listener, my student, and uh, for those adults who learn, for them naturally to be motivated. Uh, and uh, and just, just get this, absorb this new material in organic way. And neurophysiology actually helps us to understand how these complex mechanisms work, how we perceive information, how we actually process it, and how we do control the process of learning. Self-control, self-motivation, and all these complex tools, really you have to know it uh, if you want to use it properly and form the proper methodology and content. So the design of the process is significant, yeah. I go back to the question online, offline, so, do we have a perspective for the online to replace offline? 
as uh, an expert in education, I'll step out of moderation. We have interesting research on children's uh, education. The smaller the child is, uh, the more it approach to, approaches to zero. I mean, the achievements in the education area. The older the child, the more of self-control we have, the more chances there is to study online. And this process gives more performance and result. If we speak about higher education and adult learning, what is your opinion? I think that the knowledge component, that component when we give it from mouth to mouth, it can go online, that kind of transfer. But we still have to create new formats. It's not just video lesson where a person, uh, where we have a person as a talking head uh, and just reading a text you have to listen to. By the way, I love the list. I, I don't like the listener word because we can actually use various channels. We don't only have audios. For some people, the audio perception goes worse than like visual perception. So the knowledge component, yes, we can actually uh, bring it somehow, but we can't get rid of social contact. We can't exclude it. We can't, um, in online so far, we cannot create uh, certain products which would uh, launch transformational changes in a human being. When you know we go to another level of the world perception and understanding, if we go back to adults, when a person becomes uh, a manager, uh, a proficient manager, this is a different world, another skills and mm, another vision, another perspective of the world. We use another filter for it. You have to get a transformation. When you become a higher scale manager, it's another transformation. And these processes, uh, these take place only when, it, when we have social contact. We will never get rid of that. I just want to add, okay, and then two questions from the hall and we'll finalize. What's wrong with online? It's not like it's not adapted to the way our brain works. Our brain is not uh, absorbing the passive information properly. It's not charged with it. It is charged to start actively using the information we get. So. What we do, we design it, is the problem we want to solve. How to approach online to offline. By the way, we have this uh, extramural and full time. So if you actually see the person you're teaching or not, the figures for this COVID year, 75% of teachers, they don't want to go to online. We had loads of lectures uh, and we even made some good money. We stopped. We don't want to give these lectures in online when you don't see your people. The second thing, more important, two third of teachers do think that children, they're cheating online. So online generates mistrust in educational system. And this is a huge problem that so far we don't, we don't have the solution. Third, a positive thing there is each every 10 years the uh, for example the paper reading and online reading every 10 years people still take the paper information better but uh, they, they think anyway they think that they do it better online so it's really confused but every 10 years we move with little steps cl closer to it, we adapt, but, but, but slowly to the digital. The adaptation that we form is at the expense of what? Let's have a better content. And we have more and more of that content, more and more, and it, it makes it worse. How to rebuild it, how to transform it. We have a star, a lecturer. Why repeating something he says? Because he has the best way to tell the information. What goes next? What I will do with information? I need to have a person. I, I, I will talk to, launch a discussion. I need to build this new story in my story, in the story of my life. You can't do it without a teacher. You just can't. We can't just destroy offline or fully refuse from it. It won't work. We will learn more and more online. I do agree 100%.
how to transform the system. Yeah, we found the consensus. Now, uh, the last, last, last question, less philosophical, but really still is relevant. Victor, it goes to you. So we have some uh, new research saying that COVID affects our cognitive ability. 81% of interviewees uh, in the research by British Imperial College, they state that because of COVID, their cognitive abilities uh, decreased for quite a long period. They had some problems. So how to work with that? Yes, we have the surveys. We have various research showing uh, the objective results that truly people who actually had COVID, especially those who had uh, this uh, gray form of COVID. Yes, they had some problem with the cognitive abilities. <laughs> there are a couple of mechanisms, by the way, and there's no one mechanism for the virus affecting us, actually, no single algorithm. What are the plausible reasons? The lung. The problem with the lung, we have, if our lungs uh, suffer, hypoxic condition for the neurons, lack of oxygen. This doesn't work well. This is really critical. <laughs> this is this is a hypoxic uh, condition. Neurons become over uh, excited and uh, they die. Too much energy spent. Too intense immune response uh, gives excessive activation uh, of the immune component cells in the brain, which do provoke very complex biochemical processes, decreasing the effectiveness of neurons activity and leading to such thing as neurophagy when neurons are destroyed in the brain. So a lot of mechanisms are there and truly these infectious diseases and COVID-19, it's really not okay for our cognitive abilities. Is this reversible? Well, the organic uh, organic damage can be somehow compensated with neuroplasticity, but we still don't understand how destructive uh, that was. So it's pretty individual. Try to control the negative stuff, stimulate new structures, emergence in the brain. So we go again to sport. Good. Colleagues, I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, just to finish with some positive stuff. One advice from each of you. What do you do regularly to keep your brain fit? Keep it plastic as a tool for learning. I've been in education for more than 10 uh, for more than 20 years, but only recently I've uh, understood the essence of this process. It's not just new knowledge. It's the cognitive reserve in the brain, adaptivity, stress resistance, creativity, professionalism. Sidhi, how we call that thing when uh, people think in the same way, rigidity. Yeah, rigidity. So make your activity more diverse and it, it's gonna be okay with your brain and you as well. Thank you, Judy. First of all, to train, to learn, to develop, you need to motivate yourself. When we have motivation, you can retrain always. Learn how to learn, how to continue learning, how to make it continuous. Last thing, so when we teach PhDs, not just to be specialists, but the problem solvers, that's what's important. And then uh, these uh, special and soft skills can be merged. And when someone knows how to solve problems, and can learn, this person can achieve something. Learn how to learn in problem solving. If you love the topic of the panel, we have a wonderful course at Coursera, learning how to learn. It's a record-breaking course about how our brain is learning. Said he.
two things. The basic stuff that we face is the problem that, you know, the mechanism of brain uh, learning, these are the same processes. If you can learn this, you can learn the other thing. When we become older, we face situations which were not pleasant. We get this as negative experience, fix it, and we don't want to get this again elsewhere. Any learning is about getting something new. It's about stress. We somehow have to overcome this negative experience. And what Victor mentioned, the coping strategies helping you to make a first step. Everything we think of ourselves, your personal story is la lie. What happened to you when you were 15, it does not affect you when you're 30, but we want to say like, I am like this because I had something when I was 15. No. 30-40% of your memory is something invented, something illusionary. Uh, these are not real memories. Each time when I try to remember something, I reprocess it again. So memory is very flexible and it's changing. If you have some doubts about your own uh, bias, it will move you, it will push you forward. If you are sure that you can't, if you're confident that you can learn something, and then you'll just laugh at yourself saying, ah, forget it. There's no difference what to learn. I can learn. Then it will work. One advice, please. One advice, please. When we think about learning, the key thing is to teach yourself and your children the metacognition. What works the best for you? And we don't teach people. We give texts, learn this by heart. When children ask, why do I need to read this? We don't know what to say. The key question is why? If we ask, if we teach people to ask why, then the part of the way is their motivation, yes. Understand why. Put everything, all the experience under doubt, be un open-minded and uh, motivate yourself for new experience. Valeria, cope the stress. If about myself, you asked about me, yes, my personal experience. Uh, what I learned is to work with information, process information. We have a lot of information which uh, is fake. So please evaluate it, analyze it. Get the original uh, sources, always doubt everything and mind-body connection. Sometimes you have to understand that the way our brain works depends on our body. Wonderful advice. Take care of what you put in your brain. Be careful with that. So thank you for attention. I do hope it was interesting. And I want your brain always to be plastic and uh, 